China's GDP fell 6.8% in the first quarter of this year. This was the first negative quarterly growth rate since 1992. Even more surprisingly, China's Premier Li Keqiang told the world at a May 29th press conference that 600 million people in China earn less than 150 USD a month on average. Is China the world's second largest economy in an economic crisis? Welcome to China Observer. I'm Fox Canning. China has impressed the world as powerful and rich. Multinational corporations are attracted to the huge market in China, and luxury stores are looking forward to Chinese clients. But soon, they'll see a different China. The 2019 Personal Disposable Income per Capita, released by China's Bureau of Statistics, confirms the Chinese Premier's assertion that in 2019, a Chinese citizen's average disposable income per capita is over 4,000 USD a year. With a population of 1.4 billion, China is the world's second largest economy. So why do 600 million people earn so little? Because there is a two-tier divide in China, where one rich family can equal a large number of poor families. This group of people has not benefited from China's rapid economic development. They have provided the country with a very cheap labor force that has made China the factory of the world for the past two decades without getting the compensation they deserve. But worst of all, perhaps now they will even lose their jobs. China, a city known as the barometer of Chinese exports, is an important base for Chinese exports. The wholesale market there is home to about 70,000 vendors supplying 1,700 items ranging from flashlights to mechanical parts. Most merchants in Yiwu say they have lost at least half of their business this year. Yiwu is not an isolated case. It is a common scene across China's manufacturing centers. <laughs> China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001 resulted in a massive boost to China's economic development. It gave China unparalleled access to the U.S. market. With one-sixth of the world's cheap labor, China has caused unemployment and bankruptcies in the manufacturing industries of many countries. International trade must be mutually beneficial to be sustainable. If China is earning a trade surplus, selling more and buying less for a prolonged period of time, other countries and trading partners will eventually come to their senses and rectify the situation. 90% of China's foreign trade surplus comes from U.S.-China trade, so the U.S. government's decisions on trade have a huge impact on China. In 2016, before the U.S.-China trade war began, China's trade surplus with the U.S. was $347 million. According to a report by the Economic Policy Institute in February, since 2001, U.S. trade with China has been declining. The deficit surged, costing an estimated 3.7 million U.S. jobs between 2001 and 2018. The EPI report found that the CCP used trade to achieve trade-distorting practices, exchange rate manipulation, and currency misalignment. The exploitation of the wages and labor rights of mainline Chinese workers has flooded the U.S. market with cheap and CCP-subsidized Chinese products. Since President Trump took office, the United States and China have begun economic and trade negotiations. These initiatives are very clear signals to multinational companies that the U.S.-China trade is entering a risky period. These risks include tariff and cost risk, single supply source risk, intellectual property risk, social security risk, and cybersecurity risk, etc. Companies that rely on Chinese manufacturing to export to the U.S. market have had to adjust their production chains and shift orders. Some countries are slowly approaching U.S. policy on the sidelines. 
In April, Japan allocated 2.2 billion USD from an unprecedented economic stimulus package to help manufacturers move their production bases out of China. On June 15th, the European Union announced that from June 16th, it would impose countervailing duties of up to 99.7% on Chinese fiberglass producers from China and Egypt. This is the first time the EU has made a rare tariff decision against a Chinese company operating outside of the country. That now more than ever we have to disentangle ourselves from the Chinese economy and bring our supply, our supply chain home to the United States or to North America or to our allies instead of doing business with China. I can tell you the, uh, the heat has been turned up in the Congress. China's economy still has a huge problem, which is a lack of diversity in its economy. Let's look at a comparison of the top 20 most profitable listed companies in China and the United States. The top 20 most profitable companies in the US fall within the sectors of information technology, healthcare, banking, telecom, consumer goods, and energy. The US has a much more diversified economy. Whereas 16 of China's top 20 companies are home banks and state-owned or partly owned insurance companies that are institutions of the state the rest being wineries, energy, and construction companies. China doesn't have a pronounced advantage in any sector. China relies on foreign imports for 90% of its microchips. As the U.S. government prepares to ban U.S. companies from supplying China's Huawei, ZTE, and other telecoms companies with chips, the development of China's information industry is encountering significant barriers what has followed are frequent mistakes and the slowdown in the development of the military, aerospace, and high-tech sectors. Many working in the industry believe it was simply because U.S. companies stopped supplying chips to China. Our adversaries have transfer uh, organizations, technology transfer institutes. So when they steal the innovation, it goes into a technology transfer, transfer institute and they extract out how much of this can be commercial to kill the U.S. economy and grow our Chinese economy and um, what are the military applications. So it's stripped how it can be used both uh, commercially as well as military. Um, so there, it's an absolute professional network. What's refreshing is our government at the, uh, at the very high levels says enough is enough. We're not going to allow you to steal our innovation and our industry and our economy and we're going to defend that uh, very, very significantly. China's real estate industry has an annual sales volume of over 2 trillion US dollars and when including the entire upstream and downstream industries, it accounts for about 30% of China's GDP, making it one of the largest industries in the world. China has built its economic boom on a single sector, real estate, and eventually the country's real estate supply is bound to outpace demand. According to a senior researcher in China, the supply of housing in China has exceeded demand since 2011, with the vacancy rate of urban housing reaching as high as 10% and it taking 6 years to sell all the homes for sale, the real estate market has entered the danger zone. The most dangerous statistic is that 70% of Chinese people's personal assets are invested in real estate. If businesses go bankrupt, unemployment will spread and a financial crisis will occur, causing China's real estate industry to eventually collapse. China's unemployment figures are a mystery. China's premier also agrees unemployment is a huge problem in China. At the end of last year, Li Keqiang issued a document that called for stabilizing employment as a top priority to prevent large-scale unemployment in China. At a press conference on May 29th of this year, Li Keqiang said that employment is the biggest livelihood.
，三十多年每年如此，但今年就没有找到工作，全家都陷入困境。还有一些个体工商户，他们已经歇业几个月了。一些外贸企业的职工，他们that China's economic development represents a model of success for socialism. But that's far from the truth. In a changing international landscape, its decline and collapse may just happen overnight. Thank you for watching China Observer. See you next time.